You're listening to the Apple Insider Podcast. Welcome to this, the 133rd episode of the Apple Insider Podcast. I'm your host, Victor Marks, and joining me is Neil Hughes from Scenic Brooklyn. Hi, how you doing, Victor? I'm amazing. How are you? Very scenic here. A lot of construction going on outside, so I apologize in advance for the noise if anybody hears it. Yeah, that's that's called improving the scenery. <laughs> well, we've got a lot to cover, and we're going to get into it right away. Let's start off with new device rumors, shall we? Let's do it. Okay. Let's talk about the iPhone 8, mm-hmm. which could be called anything right? iPhone 8 is just a made-up name that we're using so that people understand that it's the thing that comes after the current phone, which is the iPhone 7. Yeah, that came up in the comments this week. I I delved into the comments because somebody raised a question about why we're calling it the iPhone 8, and then I tried to explain why we're calling it the iPhone 8, which some people didn't really (laughs) take kindly to. I I don't know. Why someone gets so upset over this, I don't know. Here's what it is. Most people are searching for the term iPhone 8. Most people are talking about the iPhone 8. Most people are calling it the iPhone 8. And so, therefore, if we were to call it anything other than the iPhone 8 in a story, in a headline, that does a disservice to readers who might be looking for information on the iPhone 8. Now, this is a unrevealed name of an unrevealed product. So, you can call it anything. You can call it the iPhone X. You can call it the iPhone Pro. It doesn't matter what you want to call it. The public has settled on iPhone 8. And until Apple comes out and announces the name of the product, we will continue to call it the iPhone 8. Yes. So, one of the things we've been talking about is the release cycle. And people are concerned people many analysts have spilled a lot of ink talking about the release cycle and mm-hmm. the notion that this is somehow going to be released late right right that it's delayed till november or that it's going to release in october that it's not even in production yet so let's let's go through these stories one by one yeah just when we thought we had some clarity on this right no there's no clarity so <laughs> A, a South Korean component supplier, or an, let's let's be even more cagey, an alleged component supplier. Well, actually, they're, they're they're actually a component supplier, but they're allegedly a component supplier to Apple. Is complaining that the company is pushing back the launch of the iPhone eight until November, but they're going to launch an updated iPhone seven seven S family in September. Uh, there's there are unnamed sources, but the Korea Herald, which is a newspaper of record, reported that. The delay is related to an unfinished design and technical challenges, and that they approved the September launch of two LCD models, but the OLED phone is likely to be delayed until November, mm-hmm. claiming that there are some decisions that are not yet finalized, right. specifically around the rear design, the back. So this is this is uncertain, but it's not like we have a preponderance of people agreeing that this is the case. We had a bunch of analysts saying this kind of thing before, right. but we've got Ming-Chi Kuo, who says that the phone is not going into production until September. So that kind of agrees with this. Although I want to say that if the phone only goes into production in September, that launching in November seems like it would be very, very short in supply. Well, he's saying it's going to go into production in September and launch that month, but they're only going to be able to produce two to four million units that month, if that. Right. So the way that this played out this week was... Things started to change last week when Apple gave their earnings because it looked like the September quarter, uh, which ends at the end of September, was going to have a pretty good uptick year over year based on Apple's own guidance. So we're looking at, uh, you know, we're we're looking at potentially launching all three new iPhones in September is what analysts started to say just based on the numbers. Then Ming-Chi Kuo weighed in this week, who has a pretty good track record, regardless of what you think of him. He's got a pretty good track record on predicting Apple's future hardware plans. He said... Yeah, they're going to start production in September. The iPhone 7S is already in production. The iPhone 8 is going to begin in September. All three are going to launch on the same date, and it's going to be very limited availability of the iPhone 8, but the 7S is going to be pretty plentiful on launch day. And then the next day, uh, Digit Times weighed in. Now, Digit Times is... I was getting to that. (laughs) Yeah. They're a Taiwanese publication that um, has a very hit or miss track record on future plans. You can't throw the baby out with the bathwater is the way I would put it, uh, but you really can't take them at their word because they're not super reliable. it's, It's important to understand what they're using for sources, right? Right. Digit Times, when they're talking about something, is looking at... Not not the holistic view of the product line and what Apple should do based on what they've done in the past. Right. But they're looking at specific 
points of data, points of reports, I should say, instead of data, uh, anecdotal information coming from their sources that talk about parts supply. Right. So when when Digitimes has a report, they're not talking about a thing that's based off of a previous product because they can look at the product line and know what should come next. They're looking at um, so many people placed an order of so many different parts of a display, and that display is destined for an Apple uh, assembly. And so based on that thing, we think this, right? They're extrapolating based off of the parts as opposed to looking at the product line and seeing where things slot in. So a great example of that is last year when the revamped MacBook Pro came out, there were rumors that the MacBook Pro was going to have a high-end model with the touch bar and all that, but then that there was going to be a new high-end MacBook Air, which was going to be more akin to a MacBook Pro. And that rumor went around for a while and actually came from a number of publications. And the reason for that was... It's the entry-level MacBook Pro without touch bar, and it had such a thin chassis and small design that people saw it as a MacBook Air successor. And so nobody really knows in the supply chain how they're going to price it or how they're going to brand it. So there were reports for a while that the MacBook Air was going to get some sort of a, a revamp or something. Uh, it turns out that wasn't the case. It's considered a MacBook Pro, but you know what's in a name, right? Right. So the, the right thing to do with Digitimes information is to to understand what they're saying but not necessarily accept their conclusions about what they're saying. Right. Look look at the sources and then draw your own conclusions based upon that. Well, Digitimes contra- contradicted um uh, Ming Chi Kuo and they said that the iPhone 8 is going to launch later uh than the iPhone 7s. And mm-hmm. then now just yeah, the new the, the report from this week is that Correct. the iPhone 8 is already in mass production despite everyone else's claims. Oh, yes. They said that it's already, yes, you're right. They said it's already in mass production. I can't even get all my supply chain reports right here. <laughs> and then just now, as we were about to go and start recording, is when um, the Korea Herald chimed in and say that the phone is not going to launch until November. Right. And they they are casting even more doubt because Ming-Chi Kuo had said that the Touch ID uh, situation was settled, that the iPhone 8 is not going to have Touch ID fingerprint sensor, and it's going to be replaced with new facial recognition technology. Now, the Korea Herald, in their latest report, is chiming in and saying that Touch ID is not settled, Apple is still unsure about it, wait, and may wait. move it to the back of the device. No, no, wait, wait. The what, what I understood from the Korean Herald was that the design of the back is not settled. No, it says Touch I, ID. Okay. I, I wasn't taking that to mean Touch ID because there are a couple of other things you can do with the back, including wireless charging. Right. Well, yeah, that's expected to happen as well. Right. But both of those are reliant on the design of the back. It says the OLED iPhone has been widely rumored to feature on-screen fingerprint scanning that would remove the physical home button on the bottom of the device. But sources said Apple may have ditched the plan recently due to technical glitches. So, things that are unclear. When this thing is launching, when this thing is in mass production, if it isn't already... And what the back will be like, basically. Right. Okay. There's a lot to untangle here. Yeah, and like I said, this report just just broke five minutes before we started recording this podcast. So we're kind of, you know, this is very fluid right now. It's clear as mud. But this latest report seems to suggest that Apple may, after all, move the fingerprint sensor to the back of the phone. Which I don't see happening, but... Um, that's what their source says. They, they quoted a source here in the Korea Herald, which says the iPhone's rear design has not been finalized. We're still waiting for Apple's final design before shipping parts. The person said, hinting that the phone is also likely to have a fingerprint sensor on the back. Right. But this kind of design has to be decided now. They're, they it are would have been decided. Mo- it would have been decided mon- months ago. So that's yeah. why I, you got to look at these reports and take them with a grain of salt because someone from the supply chain is feeding this to the Korea Herald, which is a reputable newspaper. But this is this information is being presented in a way that's not accurate. Yeah. So th- this decision has to be made in order for the phone to even become to to get into production. Uh, parts that have to be made around it that have to be ramped up as well. The the whole thing, right? There's there's a lot that's involved in that. The well, and the suggestion other part that- is all of the fall on things, right? The knock on effects, which are the case manufacturers that also have to have information to be ready. So th- this decision. L- listen, there, there's there's no way that Apple is going to because this report is suggesting that we're, not, we're not in August. This is this is August 11th when you'll be listening to this for the thing to turn on and ship in September. These decisions had to have been made already. You agree? 
Yes, but but this okay. report is in addition saying that Apple is going to delay the announcement of the iPhone 8 so that, that it won't be announced in September. It will be at a later date. I mean, that doesn't make any sense for a number of reasons, including the fact that if they launched an iPhone 7S and then a month later said, here's another iPhone, people are going to be throwing bricks at the headquarters. I mean, th- there's no way that they would do this. The closest example you would have to that is earlier this year, launching the $330 iPad um, without an event. And then launching a $650 iPad four months later, three months later, whatever it was. But those were so differently priced and targeted such different markets. And it was clear that the new iPad was a low-end model that wasn't a pro. And it was announced without a big media event. Do you really think that Apple is going to announce an iPhone 7S with wireless charging without having a media event? Do you really think that they would do that and announce an iPhone 8 a month later and then have everybody really ticked off at them? I mean, even if the iPhone 8 is delayed until November, which is certainly possible, even if it is delayed, the fact that they would hold an event and not pre-announce the phone at that event would be a huge, huge marketing mistake for Apple that would upset a lot of customers. Well, and these media events take a lot of planning to pull off. They have to, to arrange the space. They have to arrange everything for it. They practice weeks in advance. Right. They have to send out announcements in time so that the media people that they want to attend can actually be present in the auditorium, Mm -hmm. right? They're they're not holding an event if they can't get John Gruber in the seat. Yeah. Right? So it is a a difficult thing to to suggest that they're going to go ahead and put this together without having it announced at the event that they're going to hold. But even if it's true, even if it's delayed... What they would do is they would announce it alongside the phone and say, you'll get it in a month because they've done stuff like that before. This has happened. This is not unheard of. Apple usually launches a phone a week and a half, two and a half weeks after they announce it. But if they were biased as an American that that the phone is available when they announce it or nearly when they announce it. Typically, if you listen to the announcements, the phone is available in North America and some countries. Usually like eight to ten countries. Right. Immediately with another set following on thereafter. Right. Right. So the, the, none, of, none, none of this is unusual to announce and then say you'll get it soon. Right. I, I think that, you know, if they were to have to delay the iPhone 8 for some unforeseen last minute reason and launch it in November, they would announce it in late September at an event and say, you can get the iPhone 7S tomorrow or next week or whatever, and you can get your iPhone 8 in a month and pre-orders start next week. Yeah. So... I want to stop everything right there for a moment and tell you about a really killer deal we have. This is a deal that is exclusive to us right now. So Apple's high-end 15-inch MacBook Pro is available to you for $700 off list price with free JBL headphones and no tax in 48 states. Let me lay this out for you. So B&H Photo, popular photography business in New York, is offering Apple Insider listeners an exclusive discount on the late 2016 15-inch MacBook Pro with a 2.7 gigahertz processor, 512 gig of storage, and the Radeon 455 graphics card. That's $2,099. That's $700 off the price. You'll also get a free pair of JBL Bluetooth headphones that are valued at $80. And you get expedited free shipping and no tax outside of New York and New Jersey. This is a really good deal. This is a seriously good deal. The link will be in the show notes. We're partnering up this week to offer that to you with B&H. And if you've been thinking about getting a laptop, this is your chance. And because it's an exclusive deal, people should know that they have to go to Apple Insider on mobile or desktop and click through the links on our article on our homepage or in the show notes. Um, It's going to be pinned near the top of our page so people can take advantage of it. But the only way that you can get this deal is to go to appleinsider.com and click the link. Otherwise, it won't show up. And I want to mention that this model of laptop is completely sold out at other resellers and is $300 cheaper than buying the the silver model from Amazon without even factoring in the $80 pair of Bluetooth headphones. So if you've been waiting, if you've been waiting for your opportunity, this is your opportunity. Let's talk HomeKit for a moment. I know that seems like a strange diversion, and we've got a little more to discuss about the iPhone 8, but let's let's break things up a little bit. So I know that you have a home that's fitted out with HomeKit stuff. Mm Mm-hmm. And you have an interesting kind of setup because you're using two different ways of addressing lighting. You have, if I'm not mistaken, Lutron for some of your lights and Philips Hue for others. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. Um, The the main problem that I have with HomeKit, um, especially if you have uh, somebody else that you live with that doesn't really want to mess around with your bulbs, is uh, it's a switch issue. If you put a, a 
home kit bulb in a socket and you have a regular switch, the bulb doesn't work when the switch is off. So you either have to tape your switches on or, or do something crazy like that to actually be able to use Siri to control your lights. Um, so I've addressed that by having two different systems. Um, I have hue bulbs with hue switches in some spots. Um, and then the, the, the lines are hardwired. So the bulb is always on and getting power. Um, but not turned on, obviously. And then for lights that don't change color, um, I have Lutron switches. And it's a good combination. It works. Yeah. Uh, I have always thought that controlling at the switch makes a lot more sense than controlling at the bulb. Correct. Uh, setting up control at the bulb is easier from a standpoint of user install. It's a lot easier to change a light bulb than it is to change a switch. But when you have light fixtures that are mounted on your ceiling that are a part of multi-bulb fixtures, it makes a ton more sense to control the switch than it does to control each individual bulb. Mm -hmm. But as I say, it's easy and it's a lot easier for consumers to understand the, the idea of changing the bulb. So Ikea trad fry is, or trad free. I'm honestly not sure how to pronounce Who knows? Ikea names. <sighs> Ikea product naming is, is one of those entertaining things for Americans to, <laughs> to reckon with. But the IKEA Tradfree is a smart bulb line that's been updated with Apple HomeKit. And so the bulbs were available previously. Uh, they span a large number of different types of residential bulb connectors. They have desk lamps with the E12 connector. They have the E27 connector. They have uh, the GU10 connector. They're, they're basically, if there's a fixture that you need a bulb for, they have your bulb. And they have a network gateway that plugs into an Ethernet connector on a router so that you can then control it with your phone. This is because the IKEA bulbs are, are doing the same thing that Philips Hue is. They're, they're all Zigbee bulbs, basically. And they're, they're all using some form of the ZLL, Zigbee Light Link, um, standard. Mm -hmm. And so you have to have a bridge that converts that Zigbee radio to Ethernet so that your phone over Wi-Fi can control the and Ethernet and the Zigbee. and the bridge has to have a HomeKit chip in it too for authentication. Yes, it does. So the bridge that that plugs into the Ethernet has a HomeKit chip that is uh, supplied to them as part of the MFI program, and that allows you to do that control. The bulbs themselves are quite affordable. Uh, they they range from anywhere from let's say about twelve dollars up to about twenty five dollars for ones that have a motion sensor kit with them. The whole gateway kit is two bulbs, a remote control, and the gateway for eighty dollars. So it's it's not that terrible a kit in terms of affordability compared with some of the other competitors that are in bulb space. Mm -hmm. um, what's interesting is that the app was updated. Uh, on the fly, it was it was not really well announced that this. We sort of knew this was coming, right? But there wasn't a whole lot of fanfare around this. Yeah. Uh, it, confirmation of the change only came after a a user noticed the technical details and performed a firmware update, and all of a sudden it starts doing it. And, and Victor, you and I are always skeptical when when these companies uh, ship products and say, "Oh, we're going to add HomeKit support later," because they never do. And so this was doubly surprising because while IKEA said they were going to add HomeKit support. Um, you always wonder if these companies actually understand what that entails. And the fact that they were able to flip the switch and make it work today shows that they planned ahead, they shipped it with the necessary hardware, and they made it work. So the things that are required to make a, a change like this are that they had the chip inside, and normally that they had an eight-digit code, because each piece of hardware uses its own individual eight-digit code right. to, to identify. And that they were prepared well in advance and understood that they needed these things to be able to turn it on was pretty impressive. Yeah, definitely. We've we've dealt with a lot of products where I think the manufacturers don't realize that they need to have specific hardware or that they have to pay these licensing fees. And so they ship it and go, yeah, HomeKit's coming later, we swear, and then it never arrives. Never, never, ever. Also in HomeKit news is Chamberlain. So Chamberlain, maker of garage door openers pretty much everywhere, have had for years a, a system called MyQ Garage. And MyQ Garage has been available either as a part of a built-in unit inside your uh, garage door opener or as an affordable add-on that you connect as a bridge to Wi-Fi to, to enable the control of your garage door opener. And for years, it was available as just its own standalone unit with an app. They, too, have updated their product. Mm -hmm. Now, they haven't done it as a seamless software update the way that IKEA has. 
to get HomeKit compatibility for MyQ Garage, you have to buy a new MyQ Garage bridge. And that piece will work with any of the, the Chamberlain garage door openers manufactured since I want to say about 1993 or 1994. If you have the little sensors at the bottom of your garage door that stop the door from coming down when you break the sensor at the bottom of the door, then you are ready and compatible for this kind of update. A lot of people are upset about this release because uh, they Chamberlain also promised an adapter of some sort that would basically allow any um, garage door opener to to work with HomeKit. Uh, they said it was going to be shipping in the spring, um, and it has not shipped yet. So uh, here we are. No, no, this this is the adapter. No, no, it's not. People are commenting saying this is one that works with specific models, but there's one that's just to work with more broadly. I'm going to have to dig deeper into this because my understanding was that. If you had any garage door opener from 1993 or so forward, that the old MyQ garage simply worked with any of those and enabled app communications, and that this unit is supposed to replace that one. No, there was a more universal bridge that they announced that would work with nearly any garage door opening system that was supposed to ship earlier this year, but they haven't issued any updates on the product. So the MyQ home bridge uh, addresses certain garage door openers. Um, so if you look at our story, um, it's limited to the company's MyQ garage doors without built-in Wi-Fi. Right. So the MyQ homebridge says upgrade your existing MyQ garage door opener to Siri. Right. So if you had any old garage door opener from 1990, whatever, and the, the last year's MyQ garage part, and then added on top of that, this bridge, Should work, yes. then you'd get there. But they have so, one that doesn't require the MyQ element. Um, uh, that's supposed to, right. It's just called the Smart Garage Hub. It's not a MyQ product, and that was supposed to arrive in July, but has not arrived yet. So a lot of people are pretty upset right now with this announcement because they're saying, "Hey, where where's the one that we want?" Right, and and they say here that this product, the MyQ Home Bridge that allows HomeKit, works with a garage door opener that has MyQ built into it, a non Chamberlain brand garage door opener that's connected with the accessory last year's MyQ Garage, mm-hmm. or the MyQ enabled garage door opener with the MyQ internet gateway right. and the MyQ home bridge replaces the internet gateway. So there, there are a number of ways to address this for pretty much every user. The question is how much do you have to buy and can't you just buy it all in one right. box? And the answer is today, no, but um, supposedly a solution is coming, but as with all home kit things, don't hold your breath. Well, but the universal solution is here today. You just have to buy two boxes instead right. of one. You, you, you have your existing garage door opener and you have the MyQ Garage that was, I think, about 99 bucks before. Uh, the Smart Garage Hub did not have a price announced. They just said it was supposed to come in July, actually. No, no, no. I mean, the one from last oh, year, the one that Target's been selling. Yeah. That was like 99 bucks. Yeah, and this one has an introductory price of $50 before it goes up to 70 Right. It's so also four months late. If, yeah, well, so here, here's the thing about Chamberlain, right? Chamberlain know a few things. Chamberlain know that people who have garage doors and don't have their garages packed with junk, tend to use the garage door as their primary or sole entry into their home. They'll keep the front door locked, they'll come home, they'll open the garage door, pull in, close the garage door, and then walk into Mm -hmm. their house. And Chamberlain are deathly, deathly afraid of people getting control of the garage door, because that reflects badly on them in terms of security, right? So, what they they've they've always done right when they were making it on their own when they were doing it with their own app and they were doing it with their own hardware they were a closed silo and they felt secure they felt confident that they could make sure that no one was going to break the garage door right no one was going to be able to gain entry in an unauthorized way with with home kit that meant opening up to others and they had a couple of different ways they could approach it right they could approach it by saying we'll let you monitor the status through home kit or they could approach it by saying, we'll allow you to close, but we won't allow you to open, right? They could do arbitrary things like that. But that none of that is what act people actually want. We right. know that. What people actually want is full functionality. And so it took them this long to work that out. And, you know, along the way, the HomeKit spec was revised. They were in contact with Apple. They've been talking about this for ages. You know, it was, it was two years ago at CES, they were talking about the possibility of HomeKit and Garage Door. So we know that this has been in the works for some time. This is not a product that just was simply announced in January, said to be sold in the spring, and suddenly appeared now. This is this has been going on for right. some time. And and a lot of that has been them sorting out all of their security requirements so that they'd feel confident. And it's been a long road. 
This is the same expectation that a lot and, of uh, lock makers run into a problem with. Like I, I picked up the um, uh, the Schlage Sense, and I'm really happy with it. But my expectation of the box and my wife's was that, uh, oh, I'll just walk up to the door and the lock will automatically unlock because there are locks out there that do that. But and if you're a security focused company like Schlage, you don't want to offer that to people because that's a potential major security risk. Right. And when things go wrong, how is it going to look if you have to explain? You know, well, well, your honor, our locks, they unlock when you walk up to right. them. They, they do now. And you don't have to use a key? No. And, and you don't have to use a pin pad? No. You just, you just what? You walk up to them? Well, yes. And how is that secure exactly? Right. And so once my expectations were reset a little bit, it made sense. And I was like, okay, I'm very happy with this lock. But a lot of people want, you know, something like the August lock or um, whatever else where you just walk up to it and it works. Right. And, and the August lock has, has adjusted itself over time too, right? They've changed how they do things a little bit. You know, they still have proximity unlocked, like we're talking about as an option, but they've added on the keypad, right? right? They've added, they've, they've always retained the ability to have the key on the front because they don't replace the front lock cylinder. Um, they, they've added HomeKit and they've added Siri control as a part of HomeKit. Um, but they, they've become a little bit closer to being like the others over right. time. You know, that's one of the things that that it, it's interesting, and not to talk bad about anyone, but when you ask traditional lock makers what they recommend, they will frequently say, we don't care if, and, and this has happened to me a number of times when I've been talking with them, they'll tell me, we don't care if you go with ours or the other guys, but we strongly recommend you go with someone who has a long history of making locks. That's just a sales pitch, though. <laughs> They, they throw shade at the new guys. So why don't you tell us about the Quickset premise since we're talking about locks? Oh, good. Um, the Quickset is a company with a long history of making locks. And we've reviewed the Quickset Kivo. We've reviewed the Quickset Kivo version 2. We've, we've had both of those. Those are Bluetooth locks. They are not HomeKit. So it was with a lot of excitement that I was ready for their HomeKit compatible lock, which is called Premise. And... It didn't go exactly as I planned. Let me tell you why. Uh, but first, let me tell you about some of the things they did, did accomplish. So one of the things that happens when you go to a electronically operated lock like this is that you have to have motors and you have to have batteries and you have to have Bluetooth and, and connectivity, right? So you end up with a big motor and battery box on the inside of your door. And it's it's not something you can characterize as being very elegant, no. is it? I mean, that giant big square, that rectangle that's on the back of your, your Schlage sense, is no. it beautiful? And it's loud. I mean, I would say it's not horrendously loud, but it is noticeably loud. And it's not ugly in the sense that brushed aluminum is never that ugly. Yeah, I mean, let's put it this way. I live in a... They've I live tried. in a 500 square foot apartment, yeah. and when the door automatically locks after four minutes because someone forgot to lock it, the noise always startles people that are new to my apartment. I've never been here before. Like, what was that? Well, yeah, because you have robots on your door. <laughs> but the it's it's hard to make a battery box look right. nice. It's hard to make this motor housing look nice. And, and they try. They use good materials, right? They'll carry over the brushed aluminum or the the polished brass, what have you, right? They'll make it look like the rest of the lock. But that doesn't escape the fact that it's a big battery box and mm -hmm. motor housing. And, and, you know, August, like we were talking about, tries to do that by putting the whole thing in this giant yeah. cylinder. But I have to tell you, when my wife first saw August on the door, she she said, what on earth is that thing? right? Because that's also unusual. The quick set premise has therefore achieved a huge accomplishment because they have shrunk the motor housing. They have shrunk the battery box. They have made it much smaller. And they're very proud of that. And they should be. Okay. So you told us what they did right. What, what, give us the issues because you gave this a very poor review. <laughs> Let's cut to the chase. I gave it a poor review. So here's here. Let me start with some things and then I'll wind up with the, the worst thing. So they put a glossy touchpad, a glossy keypad on the front of it. And they did that because glossy looks pretty. However, to overcome the idea that you have to, um, you know, you, you don't want people looking where your fingerprints were to decide to guess your code. So they overcome this by displaying random numbers, two random numbers that you have to enter first before you can enter your code. And in that way, it'll obscure wherever your fingerprint smudges are. Fine. This turns out in practice to be kind of terrible because the touchscreen is kind of slow to respond. And so you end up poking really hard at it, trying to get it to take it. 
if it's raining out and you've got a handful of groceries in your arms, there's nothing you want to do with pressing extra digits. You just want to press your code and get in. But because they put a glossy screen on it, they have to do Yeah, this. the keypad on my Schlage sense is matte and it doesn't pick up any fingerprints and it works fine. Exactly. So you can pick a beautifully glossy plastic touchpad and have to input extra digits that don't even work because it doesn't respond to your finger when you press them all the time. Because my phone is or nice and glossy have... and pretty. My, my door lock should be too, because I spend so much time staring at that. I, I'm, I'm not even sure, but <laughs> you know what? It was a design choice they, that we no, can argue with. They, they made the most of it. All right. Okay. Moving on. They did. The small housing, which we talked about how great the small housing is. Um, how do you change batteries on your Schlage Sense? There's a plastic piece on the top that I pop off. There's a battery compartment that pops out, and I put in four new double A's, and then I'm done. Okay, it doesn't. It's it's the cover slides off at the top, and then a carrier that carries four double A's removes out the top, and you simply change your batteries and you replace them, and you put the it takes cover thirty back. seconds. Yeah, in order to change the cover, in order to change the batteries, let's say on the quick set premise, you have to get out a screwdriver, and you have to remove three screws one on either side of the housing, and one directly at the bottom of the housing. Now, if your door is like pretty much every American door, you have the deadbolt on top, and you have the handle set and, and doorknob below. And so now you have to get a stubby screwdriver in order to get the screw out the bottom, because a long-handled screwdriver... Now, Victor, have you ever done any home improvement projects? Because, I mean, come on, using a screwdriver, seriously? You mean complaining <laughs> about a screwdriver? You don't know how to use a screwdriver, Victor? <laughs> is is. No, I do, but when I'm changing batteries... I'm being I really facetious because some jerk in the comments <laughs> who we had to ban was asking Victor if he's ever done any home improvement projects. Listen, this is... People forget when we review these things. This is... F the reviews that we write are for consumers that own Apple products. How well does this work with your Apple ecosystem? Or how does it fit into your lifestyle or whatever? This is consumer-focused technology. If you have to take a screwdriver and remove three screws to replace a battery, which, by the way, the battery doesn't last very long, uh, that's a problem. That's going to be a problem for the vast majority of people reading an Apple Insider review. So there are some people out there that like these products, and they're very passionate about it, and they want to weigh down the comments, and that's great. But you have to realize who these reviews are written for. These are for, yes, enthusiasts, but also people that like Apple products that just want things to work, which is kind of Apple's design philosophy. And so if you're going to buy something that and ties into your Apple ecosystem, you expect it to work. And by the way, if you're going to design a product, you don't need to do it overkill with three screws where two would have done. Or none. Or in fact, none at all, like the uh, competitor right. product. There, There is simply no need to keep the shiny housing on with three screws very securely when all you wanted to do was change All right, but if I only, if I only got to replace loud. the batteries once a year, what does it matter, right? Well, that would be fine. Except in my experience, extrapolating out, I would have had to change the batteries eight <laughs> times in a year. Oh, man. I just replaced the batteries on my Schlage Sense. I bought it last October, and I replaced them about two weeks ago. So they last me about 10 months. You replaced them You replaced them prematurely, too. Correct. So when it gets below either 33 or 25 percent, it's, it's one of those numbers, um, it does this thing where um, to lock or unlock the door, it has like a two-second delay. So you can press the Schlage logo on the front to lock the door when you leave, which is what I do all the time. But what it started doing was you would press it, it would flash red a couple times, and then it would lock. And the reason that Schlage does this makes perfect sense. If you're at 25%, they don't want the battery to die on you and then for you to be really angry when you're locked out of your apartment. Locked out of your house. So they start warning you yeah. with well in advance in case, you know, something happens, your batteries go kaput or whatever. They start warning you well in advance so that you get annoyed and you just replace the batteries. So my batteries were at like 25%. I probably could have got another three months out of it. But I decided at this point, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to replace the batteries because I don't like that two second delay. And what do I care about four double A's? So I popped it out, put in four exactly. new double A's. I'm back at 100% and I'll worry about it again next year when it dies. Precisely. Now, the premise was dying sometime, about a month and a half and sometimes a little bit more than that. And it was it was really frustrating. It makes a great noise to let you know that it's run out of battery. <laughs> so at night, you know, I'm getting kicked out of bed. What's that beeping? Go stop that beeping. Oh, it's the damn door lock. And... You know, you mentioned that I was I was chewed out for my my seeming inability to do home repairs. Uh, you know, one of the things that's important when you mount a deadbolt on the door like this is that you align the front and the back. You align the the handle with the uh, mm -hmm. the pinion so that it has as little resistance as possible. Because 
if you have resistance there, it's going to mean the motor has to work that much more to to turn in the, yeah. the lock, and which will chew through battery life. So I was very careful in aligning it just right so that it was almost effortless to flip turn. And when you do that, you should have long battery life. So there's no good reason why this thing ran out. And it had a couple of firmware updates over the time that I had it on the door. And none of those updates seemed to help it. Any it's, a, it's a strange thing because a lot of people in the comments were talking about their different experiences with different lo- locks. And I've had a great experience with the Schlag Sense. And a lot of people have had very poor experiences. And you go check the reviews elsewhere on Amazon and whatever. And a lot of people say it's poor battery life. It's not responsive. They have all these problems. And so... Uh, definitely when it comes to all these products, try before you buy, because, you know, some people out there may have a much better experience with the quick set and maybe they really want a glossy, uh, display on their lock. I, I don't know. Um, but, uh, you know, I certainly recommend the Schlage cause I've had zero problems with it. In fact, I have guests here a lot, uh, staying at my place because uh, surprise, surprise, we like to crash in New York for free. Um, and so like I have a guest here right now, she's, uh, from Canada and, um, I gave her, I, I, what I do is I give somebody the last four digits of their cell phone number so they can remember it. I program that in as a temporary code while they're staying here. And then that way, whenever they get back to my place, they just enter the code and get in. I've, of all the guests I've had in the last 10 months of living here not one person is at an issue with the lock at all yeah i had an issue with the schlage sense let's be completely transparent completely fair right i had the schlage sense on the door for a while and right around the ios 9 to ios 10 transition there was a firmware update and i had updated to ios 10 already and it would download the firmware update and then try and send it to the lock and it would fail sending to the lock and it failed every time. And there was nothing I could do. And I tried using an iOS 9 device to send the firmware to the lock, and I couldn't do that either. And I phoned up support once, and support told me that I really needed an iOS 9 device that was an older device than the one that I had to try and do it. And that sounded a little fishy. I ended up talking to to Schlage again, and got in touch with their support again. And they decided that no, that first support person didn't know what what the uh, correct process was. The correct answer is that the lock was failed and that they simply need to exchange the lock. They sent a fresh one out without any question. And and I want to make clear that when I was talking to them, they didn't know that I was calling from Apple Insider or anything. They just knew that I was someone with the lock. Right. There was there was no pulling strings here. It was simply just um, call back and, and try again, and, and they, they changed the lock. And since they've changed the lock, it's been perfect. Now, the first one was great on battery life as well. It just had that one firmware hiccup. And... Um, I feel like when we're talking about HomeKit devices and firmware updates, it's important to have a device that stays up to date on firmware because they're changing things to stay consistent with what Apple's changing. And uh, getting a mismatch would be a bad thing. So I wasn't content to let it sit there and stay at that old firmware level. So the the Schlage was not entirely problem-free for me, but it's been problem-free for the most part. And they, they of course, handled all the problems. With the Quickset... Um, you know, I'm still talking with them. They're they're a little bit curious what they can do about battery life and and what my experiences were, and they want to yeah. talk about it. But um, it it did not work out very well in this household. <laughs> All right, enough home kit. Let's move on. <laughs> home kits. There we go. So let's let's get back to iPhone for just a little bit. Um, iPhone eight facial recognition. Mm-hmm. So there's code that was uncovered in the home powered firmware, which is honestly the firmware that just keeps this getting. This is it, honestly it? the biggest leak we've had um, since the stolen iPhone 4 prototype, if not bigger than that. Yeah. So there's a facial recognition system, rumored, that will support payments, combined biometric security, and include hooks for third party apps. Now, we already have Touch ID third party app support, right? You can unlock. Your, your AT&T app with Touch ID. You can unlock your My Password or One Password with uh, Touch ID. You can, you can use it for all sorts of things. But you can even use Touch ID for logging in to Walmart Pay, of all things. Right. You know, so, so that's fine. But facial recognition for all of those things is, seems to be in the HomePod firmware. And suggests that that's part of So the plan. suggestion is that this thing is going to work just laying on a table. It's going to know when you're looking at it, when you're not. It's going to know um, when you're within, you know, when you want to use it for Apple Pay or what have you. It's just going to be able to see you at extreme angles and and verify that it's you. And the rumors are that this is going to be more secure than Touch ID because it's going to use multiple uh, scans of, of different features of your face to be able to figure it out. 
Now, um, I remain concerned about the security implications of this because if it can scan my face from any angle and it's laying on a table in front of me, what's to stop somebody else from just picking up the phone in front of me and now it's unlocked because it saw my face? Is it going to be continuously active, sc- actively scanning for my face when I use it um, to make sure that I'm the one using the device? And in that case, you know, how do I hand my phone off to somebody? Things like that. I don't know how this is going to work in terms of security of locking the device because to force somebody's fingerprint onto a phone is one thing entirely. But if I'm just holding my phone and somebody grabs it from me and then holds it up to my face to unlock it and then runs away, they've got a phone unlocked. And, and that seems like a potential security issue. I imagine that Apple will be able to address this. But the more I hear about it scanning your face from every angle, the more it makes me a little uncomfortable. We'll see. Uh, I understand the first thing you're going to test when you get such a device. I, I get it. Um, although I want to point out that for a lot of the critical functions and settings that you have to reauthenticate with a Correct. passcode, right? If you're changing iCloud settings, if you're changing any kind of payment setting, if you're changing, uh, you know, find my iPhone settings, all, all kinds of things uh, require entering in the passcode. Right. So you're, you're even if, and it would be a big thing that, that someone could hold it up to your face and unlock it and run away. Um, there are still things that are secured within the phone. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm so, so this is not the end of the world yet. This is still an unreleased device. And, we still and, have and I've said, it. as I've said multiple times, I'm just spitballing here at this point until the product's announced and I test it. I can't really say anything, uh, but these are the questions that pop into my head as I read these capabilities. It's like, well, that sounds really fascinating and really interesting, but you got to think of the side effects of it too. Um, I'm curious well, to see how they address so that. One of the side effects, one of the side effects as a feature goes though, is that, if you can, if your phone knows when you're looking at it, then it can silence notification sounds because it knows that you're paying. Which attention. is amazing because it can't even silence notification sounds when I'm on a phone call right now. <laughs> <laughs> you're having that too, right? You're on the phone call and all of a sudden you get a, an email I, received it, it sound. It happens to me all the time. I'm on a call and texts and emails and whatever else are coming in. My phone is constantly on vibrate. I don't even take it off vibrate and it's vibrating as my face if it's on a table and you know, or whatever, and everybody can hear it. And it's just like, uh, just, just if I'm on an audio call, just mute it for the duration of the call, please. You would, you think. would think, but apparently they're going to, apparently they so, figured out with facial recognition. So cool. Uh, I mean, that's a great, that's a great feature. That's one of those things that, um, uh, I wish was in the Apple watch, um, where, uh, again, interacting with it less. It would be nice if uh, some sort of a facial recognition capability in the Apple Watch where it knows that I'm staring at a notification so then it automatically dives deeper on the notification and gives me a little more details than it's already displaying. Yes. Now, hardware-wise, there are a ton of mock-ups that are coming out, right? right? There are mock-ups with glass backs that appear. Uh, there are mock-up videos of the mock-ups. There are mock-ups showing different colorways the rumor is three total colors for this um gold um silver and black um some of the images are lining up with this but some are showing a more copper shade i was about to ask about the right you know that might be a fake thing that might be somebody's taking poor photos maybe apple's going to change the shade of gold that they're using i don't know um but it sounds like there's only going to be three colors this year, and part of the reason for that is because they have to go with the glass back uh, to allow for wireless charging on not only the iPhone 8, but also the iPhone 7S. Uh, so the contact-based uh, wireless charging, inductive charging as they call it. So we're looking at three different colors, uh, three different phones, and hopefully an announcement in September. Now, we talked about how the screen area is is sort of divided up into the screen area and also a function area that's addressed as right. a separate screen. And it appears to be that there's code in the HomePod firmware. We're just going to keep going back to that <laughs> firmware that says that the home button area, that virtual home button function area can be resizable and can right. be hidden. It doesn't sound like apps are going to be able to hide the home button area, but videos might be able to. Which makes sense, right? You'd really want them to be hidden. I mean, I think you'd want it to be hidden for a game, for example. I mean, it's not like you load up, um, uh, you know, uh, wh- whatever game is popular right now. You're not loading up uh, Angry Birds or whatever. And, <laughs> right, what year is it? <laughs> uh, Crossy Road or whatever. I'm very sorry. Is it 2000? Uh, Clash Clans <laughs> or whatever. You, when you play those games, they 
uh, they get rid of the uh, the status bar or whatever on the top of the screen, and and they take up the full display. So um, I w- I don't know how you address that because if you make it take up the whole display, then there's no home button there, but then you have a tappable area. I, I, I don't know what the solution for that is. I'd be curious to see how it works in practice because it makes sense. You're right to not allow apps to tap into that area. But then if an app goes full screen, is it just going to be dark there in that area? Um, because you certainly wouldn't want some distracting graphic over there while you're playing a game or something. It's it's a tough question, isn't it? It will be it will be interesting to see how it works out um, because there are going to be some developer and user interface considerations that Apple has to address with a full screen display with a virtual home button. And we're not going to know really, even, even with all these leaks, we're not going to have a good idea of how it works until Apple demos it in September. I, I feel like that we're at the same point in history as we were with the iOS 7 launch. And I say that because iOS 7 was a sweeping change in interface, and we had to go ahead and relearn and refigure out how interfaces work and what the right decisions are to use for interfaces. And, and that led to the development of iOS 8 that, that gave us some more refined uh, understanding of how to use these new controls. And you have to think about the things that Apple does, and too, to lay the groundwork for future changes. Uh, like, for example, in iOS 7, the launch of the Health app, uh, in many ways, laid the groundwork for the Apple Watch um, and for, you know, a place to collect that data. Because the Health app on its own, aside from, you know, the new step counter that came in that year's model or whatever, wasn't really, no one was going to go in there and manually enter in all this data. But connected devices, including the Apple Watch, then it all starts to come together over the next few years. And so when you have a full screen display, um, you start to think about what they could do once people get used to the way to use it. Then maybe apps start tapping into the full screen. Then maybe they open it up, you know, with to developers next year, that sort of thing, especially when all the phones become full screen and, and don't have bezels. You know, you start thinking two, three, four years down the road, then things start to get really interesting. Yeah. Well, things are already oh, yeah. really interesting because uh, Unreal Engine updated with preliminary support for AR kit in yeah, iOS. Exciting. And. This was developed in convention- collaboration with Peter Jackson's Wingnut AR. So there's, you know, there's going to be a lot of really cool AR stuff. We, 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 we talk about what's going to happen with this function area. We talk about what's going to happen with AR. The there's a lot of of wide open territory to explore right now. You know, you also gave me a good segue for the Apple Watch. For ages, longtime listeners of this show will know that you and I have had a long-running bet about the Apple Watch gaining right. LTE, or, or to be more fair, gaining the ability to be a standalone right. device, gaining cellular yeah. connectivity, not necessarily LTE, whatever, because there's you know there's four G, there's five G, there's a couple of years, is, yeah. we don't know, but 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 whatever that we've talked about that, and and I had a bet with you that I lost because I was a lot more optimistic than you were. And I, I said that I thought that the Apple Watch was going to become an independent device around I Series wish 2. Had. Clearly, that didn't happen. But I, I, I placed that bet with you, and I lost. The rumor is that it's actually going to happen this coming mm-hmm. watch generation. And not only that, that the watch is going to get a new form, uh, new form factor. <clears throat> yeah, that second one, uh, take with a grain of salt, because... Uh, John Gruber of Daring Fireball was the one that said that he heard from one of his little birdies, so to speak, that um, that, uh, that it was going to get a new design. But then as soon as sites like ours started covering it, then he went back and quietly updated his story without saying that he updated it to say, oh, I wouldn't place too much faith in that because this is an unconfirmed person. So he backed off of that one pretty quickly. Um he didn't really stick his neck out on it. So maybe, maybe not. Um, I know that there are people, my wife included, who are praying for a round Apple Watch face, but uh, we will see. So what we learned from watches like Huawei and Motorola is is that a round face doesn't really help you a whole lot. It looks pretty, but it doesn't help you convey any better information that a square shape is not a bad shape for conveying right, information. Right, but... It's still an aesthetic. I mean, it's a device that's you're wearing it. It's fashion. It is. So it is. It's a yeah. fashion device. The reason that you want a new form factor, there are practical reasons besides just the fashion reason. Practically, you need to fit in this LTE radio. You need to have it get signal. Um, you need to have it have antennae. You need to be able to readjust your constraints around how you're going to manage battery and what size battery you're going to put in the thing. Um, You know, when you start talking about 
this this different kind of connectivity, it changes the equation for all the other things. There's sort of knock-on effects. There's also the practical reason. And the practical reasons are if you have a first-generation watch, as I do, or you have a Series 1 watch, which is not the same as the first-generation watch, or you have the Series 2 watch, they're all pretty indistinguishable from right. each other, aren't they? And this is not a good thing when they're all pretty indistinguishable because it makes it harder to sell the ones that are more expensive or the better equipped ones unless you know why you're getting them that are right. better equipped. It makes it harder to identify what it is you actually bought and it can lead to confusion. I thought I was buying the one thing and I bought the other right. by mistake. And it also messes with the um, the the secondhand market, right? If you are making them all look the same, then you you let people go to the secondhand market without having them feel the need to to have the new Don't brand device. Much, yeah. Status, you're, you're cannibalizing your existing mm-hmm. sales, right? Status, exactly. So there are a lot of, and this was a difficult thing. So if you think back, the iPod Touch, the First generation touch was very different. It had a, a space gray kind of back or a black back to it with mm-hmm. a beveled edge. The second and third generations were a mirrored back. And the second and third generations were outwardly identical, but inwardly were mm-hmm. differently equipped. And the third generation kept getting updates after the second generation yep. had stopped. And I ran into this problem where I, I requested to buy third generation devices and somehow managed to get sold new old stock second gen. I mean, geez, you got the uh, MacBook it's, Pro last year, and uh, you didn't even realize that it had a uh, uh, Force Touch trackpad because it looks exactly the same as the predecessor. Exactly, and they didn't change the uh, trackpad size at all. When and the chassis that. was the same, so unless you were really paying attention, it feels just like a normal trackpad. You don't know. You had no idea. And now that I've had that, I kind of miss it. But it's it's uh, one of those things where when the device looks exactly the same every time. It, it can lead to more confusion than comfort. So there's a lot of questions about an LTE or and or redesigned Apple Watch. Number one, if they do LTE, what's the premium going to be? If you look at the iPad, it's $130 premium. So if you take that same logic, uh, $269, uh, 38 millimeter or $400, uh, 40 mil- 42 millimeter watch would then become $500 and $530. Um, so... You're looking at potentially $530 for an entry level 42 millimeter uh, Series 3 Apple Watch with LTE. And that doesn't include. But your costs don't end because there. Because whatever you're going to pay to your carrier. So then the question becomes so remember, before the iPad launched with LTE, um, there were no real carrier tablet plans that were uh, 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 consumer friendly. Apple negotiated with the carrier carriers and got them to agree to month-to-month plans um and that was what they launched the first ipad with with lte um or 3g or whatever was in it at the time back in 2010 so um you know with this you got to wonder because i've seen some plans out there for lte mobile as low as like two dollars a month um and then there's some five dollars a month and then some carriers doing ten dollars a month i would expect that apple is going to get some sort of a standardized pricing from the carriers on this um, to be a little bit more flexible in terms of how it's done. Uh, I think $10 a month in addition to a phone data plan for a lot of people is going to be a bridge too far, uh, but we'll be interesting to see there. And then in addition to that, um, it will be interesting to see what the device is capable of because as we talked about before, Having connectivity is fine for notifications and those sorts of things, leaving your phone at home, making a phone call. But then when you're talking about more data intensive things, like, for example, streaming music, which a lot of people would want to do at the gym, how capable is that going to be? What kind of battery life is it going to be able to offer while doing that and GPS and Bluetooth audio all at the same time? And what level of battery life will Apple find to be acceptable? Uh, I know that if you're using GPS and um uh, um, and you're using uh, audio right now and you go out and run a marathon, some people say that it barely gets you through a full marathon and then the battery dies. Whereas for most use case throughout the day, most people are not streaming music from it and they're not uh, using GPS on it. So when it's tethered to your phone, it lasts a lot longer. What level of battery life will Apple find acceptable with LTE, uh, assuming that this product is coming this year? There's a lot of very interesting questions to be answered um, and it will be exciting to see uh, what the device is capable of and what it does. Yeah. Now I want to mention. So let's let's keep moving here. We've talked about the devices themselves. We've talked about what the rumors are for what's coming. 
Apple's R and D spending is massive, isn't yeah. it? It's huge, right? They they are spending ginormous amounts of money. Their budget for R and D is well above, gosh, just anyone else, right? Mm, not quite. Okay, not quite. Straighten me out, because I I think it's what. Oh no, you're right. You're right. They spend two billion less per year on research and development than Samsung. So yeah, this is a this is an interesting visual story. I would encourage people to go check it out in the show notes because talking about it is not going to give it the same uh, in level of of, of understanding as. Let's, let's try and summarize, just to summarize. Right? So basically, Apple, despite the fact that they make more money than everybody else, spends less on R and D than most of their competitors. Um, if you look at the amount that Apple is spending on R and D. Um, it is, you know, over a year, uh, about $11 billion, whereas Samsung is spending about 13. Um, Alphabet, which owns Google, is spending over 15. Microsoft spending about 13. Intel spending about 13. Um, so in terms of, uh, you know, hardware makers and, and companies in Apple's, you know, ecosystem and in their, in their, and their direct competitors, um, Apple's not spending nearly as much on R and D, especially when you calculate it as a percentage of their revenue. So we just put together some charts and right. it's pretty interesting. And so I would encourage people to go check it out to just kind of get some perspective on the numbers. So I think comparing Apple with Samsung makes a lot of sense. They produce many of the same types of devices, uh, where that diverges is if we're talking about Samsung heavy industries and Samsung appliances, where they're, they're putting money into that. You know, it, it's hard to separate. Well, that there out, is no it? apples to apples comparison, no pun intended, when it comes to this stuff. But we're just looking at R and D spending as a product of revenue in relation to it. And you know, if you look industry wide, Apple lags behind their competitors in terms of how much they spend, which suggests that they're more efficient with how they spend their money. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't really compare them to Alphabet because Alphabet has the the uh, Google X projects that are the weird wild hairs that they are doing R and D on. Um, and then they have, in terms of consumer products that actually get released, a far smaller segment and a far smaller product range than... Well, nobody's uh, really doing what Apple's doing, so... I mean, uh, Alphabet themselves don't make a watch. Alphabet themselves make one phone in two different sizes. They make one home, po- home speaker. They make a couple, you know, three different uh, AV devices. And that's, that's kind of it. Right. So their R and D spending is being spent on things other than those things that are similar to Apple. Microsoft are spending on Azure. They're spending on their cloud services. They're spending on Office and Xbox and a Surface. And we'll get to talking about Surface in a moment. You know, in Intel are spending on things that they want to sell to others, like, uh, but, but not directly to consumer necessarily. They're spending on parts that go into other people's products whether that's mobile eye and the self-driving system stuff or or their processors. Facebook, I'm not even sure what to say. Bots. Yeah, bots. So it's it's really difficult to make a good solid comparison. We we know a lot about Apple's R and D and Apple's R and D, some of it compares well to Samsung, some of it compares well to Intel, but there are a lot of these where where there's less crossover. Well, based on that logic, you couldn't compare any companies with one another because all companies do different things. Well, based on that <laughs> logic, no. They, these are these are well, these are companies that all play in the tech space and it's just a comparison of the numbers, that's all. Yeah. Okay. And presumably there's not a whole lot of R&D going into the the dishwasher from Samsung, although that was one of their big flagship products at last Moving year's Moving on. CES. Yeah. Uh Microsoft Surface People love their Microsoft Surface. They they really do it first. <laughs> so consumer they really consumer reports came out today and said that they can no longer recommend the Microsoft Surface laptops or tablets to consumers based on reliability data. Now, this wasn't some small sample size they pulled from. They pulled 90,741 Microsoft Surface owners, and they found that a whopping 25% of those experienced problems by the second year of ownership. And this is not with older devices. The Surface launched in late 2012, but this is from devices bought between 2014 and early 2017. And they found a uh, way out of whack device failure or issue rate uh, with Microsoft Surface hardware, uh, suggesting that uh, it's well behind Apple's MacBook and iPad. That, that is to say that 22,685 people 
had problems with their surface. Pretty astounding. It's not the kind of number you want to read about. Now, Consumer Reports has rated things badly in the past, right? Consumer Reports has rated Apple products yeah. as having problems. They, 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 they took issue with them. the MacBook Pro in 2016 because they had a battery life issue, and it turned out that they had enabled a setting that uh, was deep in Safari settings that was uh, hurting their battery life that they should not have enabled. Apple ended up addressing that with a software update so that uh, people couldn't turn that feature on, and Consumer Reports sub subsequently changed their rating to recommend the MacBook Pro. But their most famous spat with Apple came back in... Uh, I guess it was 2010, the iPhone 4 release and antenna gate. Um, they refused to recommend the iPhone 4 because of connectivity or re reception issues. Uh, they then said that they would recommend it with a case when Apple was giving out free cases. Then Apple stopped giving out free cases, so they rescinded the recommendation. Um, then they finally played nice a year later when the iPhone 4S came out, and they said the antenna issues had been addressed and they could or they could recommend the phone. It's tough. It's really tough if, if your only source of news is consumer reports, if your only um, piece of information for what you ought to buy is consumer reports, then you, you need to understand what they're saying and what they're getting at and whether or not you, you find right. yourself affected by it. Um, you know, you could very well buy in the 75% of people who love their Surface two years on, but you should be well aware that 22,685 people did. And that is out of line from other products that they, and, and this was not even based on their own hardware test. This is just a poll, a survey that they, that they conducted. So in real world use, they found that, and, and that's important to remember because while I, you know, and this applies to any review, you and I test out a product, but how often do we test, do we review a product that we've been using for the last year or something? Uh, you know, like we tested for a couple weeks and then we write a review. Um, rely, I I still like last year's Pioneer CarPlay. There you go. So, uh, you know, yeah. but but <laughs> reviews for products are written in the now because I can't write one three years later because then the product isn't sold anymore. Now there's a new iPhone out, so it's tough. I I understand um, why this is difficult and 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 uh, why they do these polls in addition to their own tests because if it takes a few years for your Surface to break down, Consumer Reports can't do that test. They, there's no way they could know. All right. Tell me about the Canex GoPlay Sidekick and so the Vi Gaming cool. Controller. Um, I like testing out iOS gaming controllers, even though the availability of games is still uh, lacking. But um, so this actually borrows the design almost mm, beat for beat from a Steel Series product that came out a couple years ago. The main difference here, there's two key differences here, and this is why I like this more than the Steel Series one from a few years ago. Um, Number one, it has a lightning port for charging at the bottom, so you can charge it with the same connector that you charge your iPhone or iPad with. And number two, um, it comes with a nice little carrying case that doubles as a stand for your iPhone. So my main problem with the old controller um, from SteelSeries was that there was absolutely no place to put your iPhone, so it was pretty much worthless uh, for gaming on an iPhone because you'd have to put it down on a table flat or whatever, you couldn't play it on a train or something like that. And considering that the ultimate goal of this thing, because it's so tiny, is portability, it doesn't make a lot of sense to have the most portable controller not work with the most portable Apple devices. Um, so I, I had to ding that product for that. This one at least addresses that. Um, you still couldn't play it on a train or standing or anything like that uh, because it still has to be set down on a table. But at least it has a way to prop up your phone um, and have it angled towards you. And it's part of the case that carries it. And it's still small. So I think that there's a market for this product. Um, it's a very small controller. But despite that, it still manages to fit on two joysticks, uh, four uh, uh, shoulder buttons, uh, four, four face buttons. Um, I, I think it's a pretty good product. Um, I'm, I'm generally pleased with it. It also is priced at $60, which is better than when these controllers first started coming out and it cost $100. So again, something else that uh, uh, puts it uh, up there. And having a lightning port is great too. Uh, KNX has been putting lightning ports on their stuff lately, um, and I'm pretty happy with that. So pretty cool. Yeah, uh, so we'll have a review up in a... Um, in a few weeks, you know, I, I mean, I still think it's overpriced uh, at $60. Uh, I'm not trying to sit here and give this a glowing review. Um, there are problems with the product, but uh, generally speaking, as far as iOS controllers go, this is one of the better ones, especially if you're looking for something that's really portable and it addresses a segment of the market that has not properly been addressed thus far. Yeah, I have the Steel Series controller and uh, I, I used it pretty much. You're only talking about the, the really tiny one or are you talking about the full size one? 
No, no, yeah, the Stratus. Yeah. So Steel Series before they did the Stratus had a very tiny one that is basically the exact same design. And in fact, I don't even know how they got away with this design because it looks almost identical. Hmm. But the old it does look kind of yeah steel the old series, steel series looks almost identical they don't sell it anymore but it looks almost identical to this new one uh from Kanex. so there was a report that that we talked a little bit about on the site and and also showed up in the financial times that talked about ar glasses you know last week we talked about a patent mm-hmm. on ar glasses uh so it's clear that apple's been spending some time about you know spend, spending some effort on head mounted displays and wearable mm-hmm. things for the head and it's, it's entirely possible that this is one of the product segments that they'll just simply say no to, that they put the research in, they found all the problems, and they're not going to continue with it. But it's equally possible that they are going to go forward with one and that they're just trying out different things. What the Financial Times article had in it that I found interesting was a reference to an unnamed source that told them that they have several designs competing internally and that the one that's currently winning has no display at all, that it's essentially a head-mounted And you camera. would pop your phone in there. No, it, it didn't say that necessarily. That's what it seemed to imply, that you would pop your phone in there and use that as the display. They, they've had a couple – so there are a couple of things like that, right? Lenovo just released one. Well, there's the one Samsung one, yeah. That, well, the, so there's, there's the Samsung Gear VR where you pop the phone in facing your eyes. What's interesting about the Lenovo one and is that they're mirroring the HoloLens layout where the phone is facing away from your eyes – and reflects on a lens surface that's in front of your face, which is is actually a better way of doing it. You know, you don't get the screen door effect as much. You don't get uh, some of the weird problems that you've noticed wearing ones with phone displays up at your head when you do it like that. And but but it seems to indicate. Let me pull this up because this was this was striking to me when I was reading it that. The FT article seemed to suggest that there was no display. No, at all. it was the in, the indication was that you would pop your phone in there. I have a number of PDFs. It, it, it already says here one. I have it right in front of me. One group of engineers said it would to be said it is to be advocating for a pair of glasses that have 3D cameras but no screens, leaving the iPhone as the hub and main display. Right, but what says that that not, says nothing about inserting it. So what? You're going to put glasses with a camera on your face and then hold your phone up to look at things? I, I don't even understand what the point of that. That's not augmented I reality. I genuinely don't no. know. That's just I a poorly written sentence know. that's but saying that's... that they're going to pop the phone in there is what it is. <laughs> yeah. Okay. What would be the point of wearing uh, glasses on your face that have a camera but no display? That's not augmented reality, unless you're sharing your point of view with somebody else. I, I agreed. It seems weird. You know, they Who knows? They could have figured out something about the way that people interact with these things and what's coming. Here's what I think. My, my best guess on this, if I had to, and I don't have any inside information on this, we, we know that Apple is working on some AR stuff obviously that goes beyond ar kit it's kind of laying the groundwork if i had to make a guess apple's exploring building their own headset because they'd be stupid not to i would guess that they would never actually release that product in the wild because most people who are going to enjoy ar aren't going to want to put a stupid thing on their face to walk around or whatever it's going to be a limited use case it will be a neat use case it will be interesting um and much like google has figured out with google glass there's a use case for it it's just not mass market if i had to guess apple will come up with some form of a reference design for a made for iphone licensed ar kit tool to pop your phone into a head mounted display to allow for ar applications in that type of environment i don't see apple actually releasing that product because i don't think most people are going to want to buy an accessory to put a thing on their face i think that even with samsung gear vr and other products like that it's one of those things that you buy and you know your nerdy friend buys it and then shows it off to the family people you know check out a demo and go oh, wow that was really cool and then they never buy it for themselves I want to go back and take everything you just said and substitute wrist and watch in that sentence. Okay. Because it seems to me that, and, and I, I apologize, I know I sound antagonistic, but it, it occurs to me that if you'd asked people two years ago or three years ago, people would have told you, I, it's, it's a limited use case to want to actually have something on the wrist. I have a watch in my phone. It's called, it's called the lock screen. There's, there's no real need where I need to have something on my wrist. I can grab my phone. That... For those limited use cases, sure, they could sell one, but it won't have Yeah, and how many watches are they selling? It's still right. not the same level as the iPhone. It's a, it's a niche product. The, the watch is a niche product. It sells probably, what, they're saying two and a half million a quarter versus last quarter they sold 42 million iPhones or something. So, I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, it, it's a, it, the question is, would it be a bigger niche product than the watch? I mean, everything's niche compared to the iPhone, I suppose. But, I, I mean, are they going to be able to sell two and a half million of these in a, in, a, in a quarter? I don't think so. 
what is the eventual future of, of things like that? What's the eventual future of the phone? You know, I had this thought the other day where what if the phone disappears? What if the phone gets absorbed into the watch and the glasses? Right. No, I, I mean, I, I, I think that that right. could be a potential future that we have. Uh, but I also think that, you know, Apple would be stupid not to look into these things and to investigate them. But I don't see them in the f near future, in the foreseeable future, releasing that product because I don't, you know, Tim Cook said years before the Apple Watch was announced that they were interested in the risk. They found the risk to be an interesting place. Tim Cook has also said he finds AR to be interesting, but he never said he finds glasses or goggles to be interesting. He just said AR. And we've seen Apple's interpretation of AR. AR kit is out there. It's going to be in everybody's phone in a in a month essentially um yeah and that's laying the groundwork for potentially yes glasses. just like we talked about with the health app laying the, the groundwork for the watch i could see that being the case i just don't see them making the glasses i see them making it a third-party manufacturer partnership and if you want the main bare bones ar experience as a gateway you have your phone you can just hold it in front of you and it works i don't see a lot of people strapping their phones to their faces you know, but we've gone through 10 years of the phone, and there are people who think the phone has become a commodity, that there's nothing more interesting you can well, do Well, that's dumb. It. We still don't even know what the iPhone 8, we, we don't even, still well even know dumb. what the iPhone 8 is going to look like or how it's going to work, and, and now it, there's no more interesting that we can do. We just spent an episode talking about the next phone. There's very interesting, believe <laughs> I'm, I, I get it. I'm just saying that, that you know, this, this device is not the last device, no. the last form. No, and, and that's why Apple's doing research into it, and they'd be stupid not to, because maybe 50 years from now, it's a contact lens that you pop in or something. Who knows, right? Um, but in terms of battery life, in terms of hardware, in terms of uh, size, in terms of all those things, there are a whole host of reasons that Apple is not going to be in a rush to release a head-mounted display. Google Glass tried to pack an Android handset into, and how did that lenses, into the glass, right? Pretty poorly for yeah. a number of reasons. And and we can go through them if we want to, but I'd rather not. The <laughs> we went through them two years ago when we had glass. The the thing that makes a lot of sense is the, the approach similar to how CarPlay works, right? CarPlay is simply a secondary display right. that accepts touch input, and there's no reason that the glasses can't be that. The phone is still the brains of the operation, but the phone doesn't have to come out of the pocket for anything anymore. Yeah, I mean th that you know something like glass. I suppose if it didn't look so geeky, and, I don't know. And eventually, eventually, you know, instead of having all of your content loaded on your phone for that kind of thing, it becomes more of a cloud connected thing anyway, relying on Apple services, right? Um, content loading from the cloud directly to your eyeballs. If Apple next year releases some sort of a VR, AR headset, I will eat my hat on this show because that is not happening. I did not <laughs> bet you for next year. I made that mistake betting you on the. Apple I mean, I, they, of course, they're working on these type of things, but they, they work on these things too to see how well they'll work with their own hardware. Sometimes just to create an ecosystem, you know, they have reference hardware and suggestions for products when it comes to HomeKit. So um, it would not surprise me if that was their approach in this. Well, interesting. So with with HomeKit things, they don't usually make a reference design themselves. What they do is they pick a, a manufacturer in the space that they. Bless who right. has the reference design. You know, for for example, the um, the smart wall plugs, iHomes. Uh, I'm blanking on one of the names, but uh, iHome. Um, but I've had so many of these things. I devices. Uh, they, they, they're all using the Marvell but, reference but design. You know, they're they're pretty much many of them are using the Marvell reference design because Apple nominated Marvell and Marvell came up with the reference design. Apple didn't provide that or do the but research. But before into they it, came to market, Apple internally developed these products to see how well it would work and so they could test it out. You know that they did. Of course they did. Mm. They would be stupid not to. I I think there's I think there's a differentiation between the way that they're developing the glasses versus the way that they're developing or would have developed accessories for home kit. Possibly. I, I think that they, I think that they don't know what they're going to do yet. I think that, you know, they, they come up with the lingos, they come up with the APIs, they say it's going to work like this. And then they hand it off to someone who's made technology in this space before with the glasses. That's, and, and for example, project Titan, that's a home built thing. But that's you know, what if the glasses, if the glasses are being pursued and then potentially the other technology that comes out of it. So, for example, we're talking about iPhone 8 recognizing your face and knowing when you're looking at the screen. Well, that's eye tracking technology that could be used for an interface for a head mounted display. Now, yeah, you need eye tracking. Don't, don't and forget tracking, that uh, the 
iPhone originally came from a tablet project that was being introduced, and it wasn't until they figured out the way to make the touchscreen work well and the momentum scrolling and those types of things that they applied it to a phone and brought about the first iPhone. So Apple's not afraid to pursue things that not, aren't necessarily going to come to market or scrapping it and because they realize that they can get technology from their development that they can apply to other products. And so that's an example where a head-mounted display, maybe it doesn't come to market and the eye-tracking technology works much better with future iPhones. Maybe. Okay. Let's end on a high note. Shares of Apple close at an all-time high of 160 and 8 cents, blowing past the previous record. So this is gains on the iPhone 8 rumors that have have brought it all the way up to to as much as 161.8. Yeah, it's uh, it's down a little bit since then. Uh, currently, as we record this, trading at about 157 dollars. Uh, but uh, shares of Apple have been doing very well lately and jumped up after the earnings call. Uh, again, because as we talked about before, the uh, guidance for the next quarter suggests that the iPhone 8 is going to launch in the September quarter. So um, investors are very high on that. They see what they're calling a super cycle with the iPhone 8, the combination of uh, iPhone 6 buyers uh, reaching the two-year point and wanting to upgrade, um, and also uh, of uh, the new design encouraging people with newer phones to want to upgrade as well. So uh, we will see what happens, but investors are very excited about the next few months of Apple. Yeah. Now, I've, I've also seen some analysts say things like, they, you know, all these things are very nice. They are very happy with what's being announced. But as far as they can, they're concerned, all of these developments mm-hmm. are already built into the share price. You know, they're, they're the continual naysayers, right? The share price has reached as much as it's ever going to reach. We're never going to see it get higher. All these are worthy developments, but mm-hmm. they aren't increasing the value, right? Um, it's an interesting thing. I tend to disagree with that view. And I disagree with that view because that's the same view that says that the iPhone is commodity hardware. That's the same view that says that no matter what Apple does to try and increase development, that all the value's already been realized. And I think it's a mistake to underestimate that and say that all the value's already been realized. That, um, you know, as we talk about iPhone 8, as we talk about things still under the surface with Project Titan, as we talk about the idea of HomePod and the idea mm-hmm. of the home control coming together. You know, it's it's not the same as when the iPod was the reigning champ and you could buy things for MP3 players as long as they were an iPod. But in, in this this difficult, different landscape, Apple is still doing very, very well. And it would be a mistake to... Uh, I'm to not going to go on a rant about Wall Street because we don't have the time for that. But uh, yeah, I mean, Apple's stock price is a <laughs> weird uh, thing that uh, I don't necessarily <laughs> agree with. But uh, the the shares of Apple are doing very well right now. Uh, I do not own any stock in Apple, but um, in reporting on it, uh, you know, this year has seen some pretty big gains and it's been a good year for Apple investors. Yeah, I for for everyone's uh, information, I do own some Apple shares. And take that with a grain of salt. All right. This is the show. Find me on appleinsider.com and uh, you can follow me on Twitter at this is Neil, N E I L. I'm Victor Marks. Thank you for joining. We'll be back next week. I really appreciate you listening. If you have comments, please feel free to reach out to us at, and of course, I'm at V Marks on Twitter. And we will be happy to correspond with you. Uh, before we close out the show, I have something I've been promising for weeks. And I'm going to give the teaser of it here. I'm going to talk about it briefly. Are you ready? I have installed wireless CarPlay. And you literally just installed very well. the show, so people know. I literally completed the install just before the show. And what I've learned so far is that you're, if you've got CarPlay, you're familiar with having a dialogue that pops up that says, um, please confirm that you'd like to launch CarPlay when your phone I is locked. CarPlay, so no. You know the screen? Oh, you're missing out. So the first screen says, uh, allow CarPlay with the name of the radio. In this case, ILX 107. While the phone is locked, your contacts and other information will appear on this car's display without unlocking your phone. And the answer there is allow, because why on earth wouldn't you? The, the goal is to get into your car and have CarPlay work without any interact with your phone, right? So that's the typical security thing where they just want to make sure you're okay with sharing your contacts, even though you're just sharing them too your own thing, the head unit. The next step, and this is new, is a dialogue that says, use wireless CarPlay with the name of the radio, ILX 107. 
CarPlay automatically connects your phone to your car's built-in display and can access your phone while it is locked. And you get to say enable wireless CarPlay or use USB only. And that's all you have to do to configure this. There's there's no magic going to settings and joining a Wi-Fi network. There's no going to settings and trying to do something nasty with Bluetooth. Apple doesn't really tell you how they're doing this. It turns out in the manual for the ILX 107, which is an Alpine head unit, it says that what the head unit is doing is creating an ad hoc Wi-Fi network that the phone is going to associate with. And it does this without using the Wi-Fi signal. What they're doing is they're they're using Wi-Fi to send information from the phone to the CarPlay unit, but they're keeping you on LTE as you're driving around for your map data and your other data. So it's it's using both of them and acting as the phone is acting as a router. When you get into the car and turn the head unit on, uh, you see the normal car version of the interface, which in, in this case would be like the FM radio. And a banner appears at the top that is very Apple-like and says, is a notification, Apple CarPlay connected. And then it launches the main CarPlay screen. It's really sweet. So it's it's really well done. Please ask your CarPlay questions. We'll be able to answer them all. For everything else, the only other big difference is that CarPlay, for the first time ever, has a battery indicator on the left column status bar. You know, when you use CarPlay, you get a clock, you get the signal strength of whatever signal you're on, and uh, and either an LTE indicator or a Wi-Fi indicator if you're parked in your driveway. And then the home button is is classically how that, that looks on the left side of the display, or the right side if you're setting it up for a right-hand drive car. With wireless CarPlay, you now, for the first time, get a battery indicator on the display, which is cool. So that's new. Other than that, it works pretty much like you'd expect. It's it's CarPlay. It's good. So please contact us. Uh, of course, I'm at VMarks on Twitter, and we'll tell you all about CarPlay next week on the Apple Insider Podcast.